Uh, all right. Um, good afternoon, and uh, thank you so much for joining us until the last event of uh, today's conference. So here we have John Nahas uh, from Avalabs. He's the VP of uh, Business Development. Uh, please welcome John Nahas. Yeah, so um, Avalanche, uh, you know, I'm sure everyone knows Avalanche here, um, but can you explain what Avalanche is and what exactly is the key difference uh, with Avalanche and other L1 chains? Thanks, Hogan, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. Um, it's great to be back in Korea. It's my third time in Korea in the past year, um, so it's always great to be here. I was at the last KBW and a couple times in between. Um, so as Hogan mentioned, I'm Vice President of business development for Ava Labs. Ava Labs is the service provider helping to grow the Avalanche ecosystem. Avalanche is a layer one blockchain. A new chain is about three years old at this point. Um, we had our main net in September of 2020. Um, and Avalanche, unlike a lot of other uh, chains that are monolithic or single chains, has a multi-chain architecture. So our primary network has three chains. We subdivided all the functions that typically run a blockchain into separate ones. So we have the X chain where our native token AVAX is, you can mint and burn uh, tokens there. Our P chain is where validation and delegation occurs, but also the ability to create subnets, which I'll get to in a second. And then finally is our C chain, that's our EVM compatible smart contracts platform. Um, you know, runs on the Ethereum virtual machine, very familiar to many of you that have interacted with Avalanche on a regular basis. The P chain, uh, which is the platform chain, is where validation and delegation occurs. But most importantly, something that differentiates Avalanche, I think, from a lot of other chains, is uh, the, our ability to launch subnets. So subnets are either private or permission chains or public permissionless chains. Um, some people call them app chains, but I think w what we look at it is it's more than that. It's specific e ecosystems and specific infrastructure technology to allow builders, developers, enterprises, and institutions to run their own blockchain environments ultimately leading to kind of a network of blockchains that, that have composability and interconnectability between everything in the ecosystem. Right, um, so subnets. I think subnets are very, you know, one of the most important features of Avalanche. Um, so what, what features of subnets really compel companies and corporates to really choose Avalanche or choose to build on Avalanche? So the title of this talk is, or this chat, right, is reaching a billion users. And I think subnets are really the key to reaching a billion users. The reason I say that is, if you're looking at a world in which blockchain technology really pr proliferates, right, the way that Web2 affects all of our lives, right? Web2 is traditionally thought of as the transfer of information peer-to-peer -peer or, or decentralized transfer of information. Web3 really is decentralized transfer of value, right? And it should be the foundational base infrastructure layer or technology that everybody builds on, right? So traditional blockchains, single monolithic blockchains, are for the most part solutions in search of a problem, right? You have one chain that has NFTs and DeFi and payments and a million other things all vying for block space on a single blockchain, which really doesn't solve the problem that institutions and corporates and, and players that really bring a million, 10 million, 100 million users on chain can do, right? Because if you're a bank, if you're a major enterprise, if you're an institution, you're not going to have your transactions or your users transacting alongside an NFT trade or a DeFi trade or something that may or may not be compliant or regulated based on the jurisdiction that you're in. So what subnets allow for is for anybody an enterprise, a bank, a corporation, an asset manager, a, a game developer, an innovative developer building a brand new primitive or protocol that needs their own blockchain because of speed, because of scalability, because of fees, to deploy their application on an on a infrastructure layer that allows them to build the solution they need to succeed. As I said previously, right, Layer one blockchains are a solution in search of a problem. These are the parameters, these are the confines, these are the things that you can use to build your application. Well, if your application doesn't fit in the infrastructure, kind of too bad. With, block, with, with subnets, the benefit is you can choose whatever virtual machine you want. It could be an Ethereum virtual machine, it could be a Move virtual machine, it could be a Solana virtual machine or based on Rust. You could choose whatever virtual machine you want. 
You can choose whatever gas token you want or have no gas token. You can choose whatever parameters you want that enable you to build the business or the application that you want while using blockchain technology, right? That's kind of the key differentiator. And I think what's stopped this industry from reaching 100 million users or a billion users is that crypto people build crypto products for crypto users. It's like the same two, three million people going in a circle, right? They jump from chain to chain or they're maxis and they stay on one chain. To really reach 10 million, and when I say users, I mean people actually doing transactions on chain. That doesn't mean someone buying a token on an exchange, right? Korea is very well known for this, right? They're the third largest market for crypto trading in the world, but there's not that many on-chain users. Koreans don't do DeFi. They don't do a lot of on-chain activities. Well, the barrier to, of entry into Web3 or on-chain activities is pretty high. You need a wallet, seed phrases, everything else. Nobody yet has built an application that's at scale or mass market that abstracts away the crypto side of things, right? That, may, that uses blockchain as the infrastructure or the, the background layer to allow a new type of application to launch, right? Um, the, the previous speaker who was sitting in this chair was saying, you know, you haven't seen adoption on our L2 yet because the, the killer apps are coming or we haven't deployed the killer apps yet. I would argue that there is still not a single killer app in crypto. I think there's a lot of cool stuff. There's a lot of innovative stuff. There's a lot of the same things that we use on a daily basis being done on chain, maybe faster, cheaper, better. But there still has not been a killer app for Web3. A killer app means it has 10 million, 15, 20, 50 million users. That doesn't exist, right? Like, I think at the height of the bull market, there's maybe I think studies show three to four million people, maybe. It's not that many people that we're really catering to on a daily basis because most people aren't using the technology in the background for, for the use cases that really allow it to succeed. So when you look at corporates, they want stable gas. They want to know that an illicit actor isn't running a validator or doing transactions on chain. That might be KYC AML at the wallet level. If you're an asset manager or a bank or, or, an, or an issuer, you need to know that the securities laws or the local laws of the jurisdiction in which you are issuing a token is built in not just at the token level but at the chain level. So you have to look at the different jurisdictions, the different businesses, the different use cases, and build applications or products that fit the use case you need, but also the geography in which you're building it. And to my knowledge, a solution does not exist for that except for subnets yet. Um, you said, John, you said um, there are, there's an absence of killer applications. And you know, as an investor, we see a lot of uh, these applications building on Avalanche or other blockchain layer ones. But what, what, in your opinion, what is the uh, you know, roadblock that's stopping all these applications from building um, you know, new mass adoption in the, in the space? So I think there's a couple things, right? I mean, you're an investor, right? How many, how many DEXs have launched, right? Since, since Uniswap, how many variations of Uniswap have come up? How many same projects, same application with a little tweak or a little improvement have launched over and over and over again? Like nobody's thinking outside the box, really, to build something new and innovative, right? So if you look at Web2, Everyone was online. What really blew up Web2 was social media. Social media, in general, was the killer app that made the internet or Web2 go viral, right? Or, or get everybody from all of us to our parents to even our grandparents online, right? So when you say, oh, are you online? Like, I would say that the killer apps that will come will be, will be like what, you know, you used to say to your mom, oh, are you online? The next iteration will be, oh, are you on chain? Right? But we have, we're not there yet because no one's built anything that just happens to use crypto or use blockchain in the back end. The, the analogy I like to say is, you know, AWS is so well known for being the cloud compute, right, that runs, that a majority of applications on the internet run on, right? AWS, GCP, Azure, whatever you want to call it, right? Well, when you log into Netflix, it doesn't say Netflix powered by AWS, right? It just works and it's built on AWS, and that's all that matters. 
but crypto people love to do it, right? Any application powered by Avalanche, powered by whoever, sometimes powered by a chain that works or doesn't work. So there's always this need to put the tech first, right? Even there's a great application on Avalanche called NFT Ticks. They're doing a fantastic stuff with NFT ticketing. But their name literally is NFT Ticks. Like nobody puts the, like, and they'll even admit to you, we did it because we want to differentiate ourselves, but we're probably going to rebrand because nobody puts the name of the technology you use in the title, right? Like it's not uh, cloud Netflix, right? It's not, it's, it's just Netflix. Like, so we need to stop, we need to stop focusing on the tech or the chain and focus on the use cases that the chains or blockchain enable you to do, right? And, and I think it's because this industry is still that young, right? We, so many people have heard of crypto and blockchain now because of the internet, because of the ability for information to proliferate, right? When the internet went live, it didn't have the internet to promote itself, right? Well, I have a friend. Um, blockchain has had the internet and social media to promote it, right? So more people are familiar with it and know about it, but not that many people use it. Right? They just know about tokens, and mostly it's Bitcoin or Ethereum or maybe even Dogecoin, right? But we don't, we, we still focus on the little things because we're still so early as an industry. I think there's a lot of tribalism, which I think hurts the industry. It made sense in the early days for people to be tribal and to argue over my chain is faster by eight tenths of a millisecond. And look, I, I still do it because I'm promoting a technology, so I'm going to talk about these things. But when you look on crypto Twitter and you look at most of the crypto press, you know, they highlight the most technical things. They still speak technical language first, not solutions language first. This technology, the point of it is to enable solutions, to enable innovation. It doesn't serve itself. So I think we need to get away from that. I think, you know, it's kind of cliche to say this, but but we, we are kind of our own worst enemy, right? Because all we do is talk amongst ourselves about topics that we know about amongst each other rather than, than growing the use cases. And John, since you um, oversee all six verticals of business development under Avalabs, um, you know, what are some projects or partnerships that you see uh, that has already adopted Avalanche or that are in the process of adopting Avalanche that you see uh, most excitement from? So yeah, you, you mentioned that I oversee the, the vertical. So the way we've broken out, or I've broken out the, the business development team in Avalanche is six verticals, and it starts on the more traditional side, although the most Web3 crypto native side, right? So on the most traditional side, you have institutional and capital markets. That's banks, asset managers, tokenization, you know, you're mo the most incumbent traditional players. Second, you have enterprise. Enterprise meaning... Uh, businesses get established businesses getting into Web3. In the middle sits wallets and exchanges. That's kind of self-explanatory. Um, but also a lot of innovation happens there because that's most people's entry into Web3 is the wallet. Uh, and then NFTs, of course, um, gaming and DeFi. Uh, what's the most exciting? I mean, you know, we've had tremendous innovation on the DeFi front on Avalanche. Really proud of all the stuff that's been happening there. I think you've seen, that's where we started, right? Because that's where the original user base was. Um, so you had the, the Ethereum blue chips like Ave, Sushi, Curve, and, and the like come on board. But most, you know, Trader Joe's a great decks on Avalanche. Um, GMX is on there. I think what you see now is a lot of new protocols coming online. We had one for a while called Platypus. That was a stable swap, single-sided stable swap. Uh, really excited about a project called Cavalry. That's coming out. They have a, 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 a project called MultiSwap, um, which I think is really going to open the door to a new way to trade tokens in general. But tokens could be crypto tokens, stables, and all kinds of assets in the future, which I think is exciting. Uh, on the flip side, you know, on our institutional and capital markets, at the other end of the spectrum, you know, we've done tokenizations for major asset managers like KKR. And I think what's really exciting for us is most recently we announced a project called uh, Evergreen. So Evergreen is, is a specific type of subnet built for institutional players. And we launched a subnet called Spruce. And on that you have major traditional, I mean, incumbent asset managers like Wellington, T. Rowe Price, um, Wisdom Tree, and Cumberland. And those are just the initial guys who came on board. 
and we've got a lot more coming that I can't talk about yet. But in a couple months, I think we'll be excited to see what's happening there. And this is really a sandbox for a lot of established people that you would not normally think would be dabbling in crypto, actually getting into crypto and Web3 because they finally have a sandbox or a chain or an area that fits their regulatory and compliance needs. So FX trades, interest rate swaps, whatever derivatives, whatever it may be, they can now do in a compliant manner, which I think the market has been missing up until this point. So just on that side, on the finance side, right? You have the innovation happening on one end of the crypto native spectrum with DeFi. And on the flip side, you have innovation that's happening on the institutional, most traditional side. And at both of those are at opposite ends of each, each spectrum, but at their most extremes, they meet, right? Because DeFi innovation <coughs> kind of inspires the traditional players to, to move forward because they kind of have to, right? Uh, their customers want it, their users want it, their depositors want it. They want to see new assets and new asset types and classes. So you see that connection there. And then everything in between kind of becomes, becomes ad additive to that. So on the enterprise side, we're really proud of the partnership we have here in Korea with SK Planet. So SK Planet recently launched their own subnet, uh, UPTN, Upton. Uh, it has its own wallet. And they're going to start to bring their applications on chain too, like OK Cash Bag, which is one of the largest uh, loyalty and rewards programs in Korea as well as many other things they have coming. Um, on the enterprise side, uh, the next couple of months are going to be very exciting for us, so I would tell everyone to stay tuned. Uh, loyalty and rewards, of course, also matter, right? So without getting into specific names and details, I think you've seen the rise of loyalty and rewards being on-chain as an additive benefit because it gives people that value that they've earned or that they've accrued by purchasing things or actions or membership or loyalty that value can now be potentially deposited into a pool. It could be traded against, it could be borrowed against. You can maybe stake these tokens to get a discount or a special benefit, et cetera, et cetera. And then you tie that in with on-chain um, identity and on-chain personas with NFTs, right? Then the NFTs can represent your on-chain persona in life and maybe abstract away your, your identity in that regard. And then game, gaming, I mean, we have AAA games like Shrapnel, and um, Godzilla coming online this year. Those are mo tens of millions of dollars uh, backed uh, games that use Web3 as a bonus, right? I think what we saw with the initial rush of GameFi was these were tokens and, and, ga and systems that were really just trading mechanisms and masquerading as a game. They weren't really games. Games, first and foremost, should be fun. They should be something you play, not something you trade all day. That's not a game, that's trading, right? So I think you've seen now the rise of, of quality game studios, particularly, most importantly, in Korea. They're at the forefront of this. Mm. Building fantastic games that have a token or an NFT component on top as a benefit, where you can earn points, rewards, skins, trade them, lend them, borrow them, you know, use DeFi protocols and primitives in, the, in an in-game economy and open that up. And what gets really exciting for us is where you start to see that layer of all these different applications work together, right? So maybe a loyalty and rewards app is something that you can trade on a DeFi protocol where you can lend, lend an asset that you own in a game to someone else. And then economies within themselves start to build on top of each other and connect with other economies and snowball into a larger networking, network effect that till ten, today I think has been a little bit lacking. Yeah, we, we, um, going back to the question about hurdles and obstacles, uh, I think we talked about you know, user experience and how it's you know, hard to onboard Web2 users onto the Web3 space. Um, and like you mentioned, one of the verticals that Avalabs is focusing on is financial institutions. So in terms of financial institutions, what are some obstacles and um, you know, hurdles that they're facing in Web3 adoption? And what's, what, what is Avalanche doing to kind of support those, uh, you know, support those institutions? to overcome those hurdles? Yeah, so on the financial side, it's very simple. These are the most, if not the most, regulated entities in the world, right? You meet with South, South Korean uh, regulators, right? They'll tell you, regardless of what asset manager, it doesn't matter how, how, how strong they are, right? Whether it's Shinhan or Mirai. You go to the US, you talk to JP Morgan or Citi or anybody. These guys have set rules. They have regulations that they have to follow, period. You break the rules, you go to jail, right? This isn't like, 
oops, I, I, I left something off a tax return. This is, you break the law, you go to jail. Or in the case of US banks, you just get a big fine and you, and you move on. The average person goes to jail. You need to be able to enforce these rules. Crypto native things don't have rules, right? The whole idea is you innovate and you figure it out as you go. Well, you know, I mentioned this, this recently with, with our Evergreen program and Spruce in particular, right? Spruce in particular was first created as a blockchain with input from those four institutions that I mentioned. Wellington, T. Rowe, uh, Cumberland, and Wisdom Tree, because their chief compliance officers or their head of compliance or their, you know, the people that they report to their regulators said, we can't do this action. We need to do it this way. This needs to be able to report. We need proper reporting on who's, in the, who's accessing the, the network. We need reporting on who's doing the transactions. We need, we need reports on the transactions that are being done. We need X, Y, Z. We need to be able to audit one, two, three. We need to be able to have real-time settlement, all these things, right? Up until t the subnet solution, what you had, and you had this with Ave Arc, right? Ave Arc was their institutional borrow lending, but Ave Arc was KYC'd and AML'd and regulated at the application layer, which meant someone had to manually still go through and white label a wallet and say, yes, Hogan, you can come and transact on this thing. Well, with subnets, your, white, your, your wallet becomes white labeled. And then whether it's you or your associate or someone else in your firm can transact in there. But everybody you're transacting with on the chain level has also been vetted and cleared. So it's, you know, when people say, oh, institutional DeFi, that doesn't make sense because it's kind of, an oxymoron, institutional and DeFi. But what it means is that every single person, let's say in this room, represents a financial institution. You can all get whitelisted as an institution to go on chain and do transactions. You can provide liquidity. I could borrow. I could do a trade with you. We can all do transactions on chain not knowing who the counterparty is. We are all in a collective pool. It's decentralized because I don't know who, who my counterparty is, right? And it, all I know is that every participant has been cleared and vetted and follows the proper protocols in order to be able to do that trade. And there's levels, right? So there's like one level that says you can do a, a swap. Another level, you can do derivatives. Another level, you can do interest rate swaps, it's so on and so forth, depending on the level in which you qualify under the criteria for each one of those actions that are set forth by the regulator that you operate in. And um, since we're in, you know, KBW, you know, I'd like to talk about Korea and how Avalanche views the Korean market. Um, so, you know, what, first of all, what, what brings you to Korea and the Avalanche team? You, you said that there's around 20 people from Avalabs um, in Korea right now for KBW. So what, how do you guys see the Korean market and how, why are you guys spending so much time, effort and money into the Korean market and the business development here? So, you know, I came to KBW last year. Uh, I knew it was going to be a big deal, and I came, and I, I was very just impressed. I was impressed by how technologically savvy everybody is. We all know how technologically forward Korea is. But really, people here get it, and they get it. What I mean by that is they get it at a more fundamental level. You know, there aren't that many Web3 or on-chain users in Korea, but Koreans are tech savvy. They know technology. They embrace technology. They use technology in every part of their everyday life. So it makes sense that an innovation that's gonna come out in the Web3 space could come out of Korea. And the, mo the people most likely to use those new innovations will be in Korea. So after the last KBW, we made a cogniz cognizant effort to expand the reach of the BD team instead of by hiring more people on BD, but instead to hire local teams. So the first team that we hired outside of the core team at Ava Labs was our Korea team. And we hired a head of Korea, Justin, who's here, to, to add to Olivia, who's, who's also been in Korea since mainnet went live on day one. Uh, we have a community manager in, in, in Korea and Eugene, and we're looking to add more people as well in, in Korea. So we're really proud of the team that we have in Korea and all the hard work that they've been doing. Um, it makes sense, right? And then the, the success of Korea has led to us expanding in in Japan second, and now India third, and we're gonna to continue to do that, but the Korea team really sets an example for how to do things. Um, 
and honestly, like I've been in meetings today all day, and, and, and this is my third time, like I said, in a year, and just really interested in the innovation that you see, the adoption that you see, and Korean regulators have set a lot more clear standards for what should and should not be done than even in the United States, to be frank, right? So you're going to see more adoption, more innovation happening in Asia, primarily in Korea, more so than anywhere else in the world, because when the rule, when you know what the rules are, you can work within them, and we don't have that really in the U.S. And among the six verticals, obviously, that you know, Avalabs focuses on, uh, you know, what excites you the most here in Korea among the six verticals? I thought you were going to ask me which one's my favorite. It's like asking, <laughs> which one's it's like asking a, a parent which one, which child is your favorite. I have two kids, and I have no favorites. Um, look, they're all equally exciting, um, but I, if I had to pick one, I would say gaming. I mean, Korea is just a juggernaut when it comes to gaming on the global stage, not just in Asia. Um, the, 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 the innovation that happens in gaming, the, the level of technology, the players in technology here are fantastic, and they really get the nuances of how to add features to a game to make the game better, right? When, I, when you talk to other people that are game developers in Web3 gaming, it's like all about Web3 first and then the game second. Nobody cares, right? Gamers particularly, studies have shown, don't care about crypto as much. They, they're turned off by it because they think it's a gimmick. I think uh, Korean game studios care about the game first, of course, the experience as well, and then anything they do on the Web3 side is just an added, additive benefit or an extra level a benefit that helps the ga overall game experience. So uh, I, I think you're going to see a lot more innovation coming out of the gaming side here. I think there's a more captive audience and user base, uh, more so than, you know, as much as I love institutions and banks, there's not that many users there, right? Um, and frankly, we need Web3 as a whole, not just Avalanche, needs to see a mass adoption event. We need to see scale, and gamers are a great place to really test the technology, not just Avalanche, not just subnets, but all chains in general. I think for the most part, most chains talk in abstract terms and theoretical uh, metrics. It's, it's, it'll be nice to see real testing of the technology for all chains and see who can live up to the claims that they, that they make uh, and see what's gonna deliver the technology layer for the next billion users. All right, um, I guess that's a wrap. Um, thank you so much for your, your time uh, in the audience, and thank you, thank you, thank you John, for um, explaining Avalanche, subnets, and your uh, you know, uh, initiative in the blockchain space. Thank you.